So welcome back, everyone. Our next speaker is Dr. Sean Krosnick and, and um, her PhD student, Chris Waters. Um, they're both from uh, Tennessee Tech, and uh, they'll be talking about pollinators um, of uh, globe bladder pods. So take it away. All right, thank you. Um, can everybody see our screen? Yes, Sean and Chris, you have until 11 o'clock and that includes your question time. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thanks so much for um, giving us the opportunity to share a little bit about what we're doing um, with the group of folks that are here today. It's really exciting to see so many people. Um, so the talk is entitled Studying Pollinator Interactions in Rare Plant Species. Um, old dog new tricks. And so I thought I would present the old dog part and then Chris <laughs> can present some of the new tricks that we're developing um, in terms of trying to bring this all together. So what I wanted to do, my part of the talk will just be kind of giving an overview of the research that we do in my lab, if the slide advances, yeah. And so this is not, you know, totally inclusive, but or exhaustive, but this is some of the stuff that relates to what we've been hearing in other talks um, today. So we work on generally plant reproductive biology. I'm really interested in breeding systems um, as well as uh, tracing specifically for shorts bladder pod, life history and demography. And then also, um, of course, looking at pollinator interactions, looking for effective pollinators um, and other types of issues that may um, arise in terms of cell compatibility and things like that. Um, and so here are some of the study organisms that we're currently looking at. Um, I'm sure that you recognize Passiflora incarnata. And then we have the Fisaria globosa up here. And then the last one shown is uh, Lilium formosanum, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So for a native study organism, that's Passiflora incarnata. Um, for naturalizing, um, I'm just referring to the Lilium formosanum. And then for rare, of course, we have Fisaria globosa. So just a little background again about some of the work with native species. Um, and so Passiflora incarnata is a really great study organism because it's convenient to find and it actually offers um, an opportunity to ask really, really interesting questions about reproductive biology. And so what um, we've basically figured out is that after looking at tons of um, individual plants and the flowers on those plants where they occur, that you can see within one plant, you can actually identify multiple floral morphs, which are basically um, different stages of development that are rest. So the idea is that, you know, a normal flower, like you can see here in E and F, this is what you'd expect to see where you have the stamens um, at the same level as the stigma. The stigma bends down during anthesis. So like within a few hours of opening, these structures, the style and stigma bend down. And if you look back up here at the top, you can see that um, carpenter bees, which are the primary pollinator, that, they're, that the stamens and the stigmas are at the perfect height to make contact with their back. But we see that there are multiple um, unique morphs that are found that never fully um, have the stamens bend down so that they're at the position where they can make contact with the pollinators. And this is because of arrest in development. So once the plant starts to have a lot of fruit, um, it switches from worrying about functional, or sorry, female fertility, and it more than says, well, we probably have enough fruit developing, so now let's focus on getting pollen out there. And so that's when you start to see, the more fruits on a plant, you start to see more prominence of these types of flowers appearing on the plant that never really go through floral development completely to give you the final, you know, ideal product. And so we've looked at that both anatomically, like you can see in the bottom corner here, these are the different morphs. Morph one is extremely um, disturbed in terms of its development. It's anomalous. You can't really have pollen move through these tissues to get to the ovary. Whereas on morphs four and 
for A and B, they're pretty normal looking. There's transmitting tissue for the pollen tubes to go through. And then you can follow this transmitting tissue here and it gets to the top of the ovary where it can then reach the ovules. But if you look up in the upper right hand corner here, you can see these are pollen tubes look, uh, visualized with UV um, fluorescence. And you can see that in morphs two and three, um, you end up having kind of a blockage where the pollen tubes cannot get down here to the ovary. And so that is essentially saying, even if pollination was successful, like in, in these types of morphs, there's some damage in here within the tissue. And you can kind of, again, see that right in here, where even though pollination was successful, that doesn't mean fertilization will be successful. And so what this results in um, is a type of functional andromonisi, which means that you have male flowers, that are functionally male, even though they may have pistils, here are the female parts, the only part that's actually working are the stamens at this point, because the female parts just really aren't doing the job of receiving the pollen and fertilizing ovules. So there's been a lot of really um, interesting uh, aspects of all this that we've discovered just by working on Passiflora carnata, and it turns out that this is actually happening happening much more broadly in the genus. Um, and so this has been a really fun project to work on, and we're still doing additional work with it, looking at how the styles actually bend down. And then I have another graduate student, um, Cassandra, who's working on Lilium formosanum. This is a quote unquote naturalizing species, but sometimes it's been classified as invasive. Um, this you can see in the distribution map, this is just clipped from iNaturalist. Um, you've got a huge distribution, particularly in the Southeast, especially Florida, Louisiana, and Texas. And um, what she's doing is trying to look at phylogeographic relationships where she's looking at samples of, from all of these different populations in the Southeast and trying to determine if these are all derived from one horticultural introduction or multiple horticultural introductions um, of different plants. People often buy Easter lilies, as you know, at the grocery store or um, nurseries. And they're generally, um, they can be many different species that have been hybridized and so on and so forth. So we're trying to figure out if it's really Lilium formosanum or if these are multiple introductions or escapes from private cultivation. But in the end, you end up with some amazing um, stands of these flowers. This is taken, this is a photo that was taken in Gainesville, Florida. Um, and so what she's doing is not only looking at the relationships between these um, horticultural uh, escapes, I guess, or these naturalizing populations, but she's also documenting pollination with sphinx moss, like um, what Tara brought up earlier. It's really fascinating to see this. And so even if they're not invasive or if they kind of become invasive, they're still, what we've found so far is they're providing really important ecological services in terms of providing nectar for these native um, insect species. So that's another project that's ongoing. And then we get to the rare plants. And we've been working on Fisaria for a long time now, I think at least uh, since 2016. And um, what I've primarily done is been looking at, again, um, reproductive details. So understanding floral phenology as best as we can um, and getting kind of baseline information. So um, we've done a lot of tests on self-compatibility. We've looked at pollen stigma interaction um, and then, of course, also trying to nail down um, what the typical patterns are with their reproductive phenology. So what you can see down in the bottom here, these, again, with um, UV staining, you can see that there are pollen grains germinating on the stigma. Here are the pollen tubes. Um, and this would be a manipulated self, meaning that the um, pollen was from the same flower. Then if you monitor these um, and you look at the ovules, you can see that when you self-pollinate for this particular population, EO3 from Hartsville, Tennessee, you do not have any self-compatibility exhibited. When you pollinate with outcrossed pollen from other genetically different plants, you do get pollen present fertilizing the ovules. 
interestingly, um, my graduate student, Emily Powell, who just graduated last May, found that this may not be the case for all of the populations. In fact, um, preliminary, well, actually her data from EO1 in Ashland City in Tennessee, as well as EO1, there's only one occurrence in Indiana, both of them actually exhibit self-compatibility, which is really surprising. Um, and so we need to next do the Kentucky populations to understand what's going on there. This plant has a long history of um, being somewhat isolated in these unique patches. And so it's not entirely surprising, I think, that you would see different reproductive systems um, within those two cases. So that's just one interesting thing that's going on. Um, then we have um, another project kind of long term trying to understand the life history of this plant. So looking at vegetative characteristics that we can somehow use to understand the success that might be anticipated with flowering. So if you look in the upper um, figure here, we've found a really strong relationship between the average taproot width, so the base of the plant's major taproot, and the number of racemes that that plant will produce. So you can tell by this, the, the um, base of the stem or the top of the taproot how many racemes will be produced later on. And there's also um, a really interesting interaction that's been going on with sedum pulchellum that you can see here. Um, and this is a Fisaria growing on, on limestone at the Hartsfield population. Um, and what we found by doing manipulated crosses is that when you include some of the other plants that are occurring at the site, such as sedum pulchellum, which is in great abundance at the same time Fisaria is flowering, if that pollen is mixed in and then placed on the stigma, it drastically inhibits the ability of the pollen tubes to fertilize the ovules. So even if you have outcross pollen, but you also have the presence of sedum pulchellum, that can be inhibiting. And so that's just one observation that we did in a common garden, but it brings up the question of, you know, what other players are involved at the field sites in terms of inhibiting successful um, fertilization of the ovules. Okay, and so then the last thing, of course, is identification of effective pollinators. And so what I'm going to do now is switch with Chris, and he's going to talk about some of that work looking at the use of eDNA. Okay, I'm going to try to get through a bunch of stuff here. So um, here's a pretty typical habitat for Fisaria globosa in Kentucky. It grows mainly in wooded limestone slopes, but the habitat differs quite a bit across the range. But in Kentucky, it has great habitat for a variety of pollinator species. Um, so in the past, there's only been one previous study that's looked at the pollination ecology of Fisaria globosa. It was a previous master's student here at Tennessee Tech. And uh, that study found six effective pollinator species and identified surface surfid flies as the primary pollinators for Fisaria. But most other species of Fisaria that are found out in the Western US uh, in the Rocky Mountains primarily are pollinated by ground nesting solitary bees. So for this study, we wanted to identify the effective pollinator species across the entire range over multiple years. We wanted to sequence genetic barcode regions of those pollinators at both CO1 and 16S, and then establish long-term monitoring protocols for the pollinator communities using environmental DNA metabarcoding. So in 2021 through 2023, um, I collected floral visitors from across the range of Fisaria globosa in various populations in Tennessee, Kentucky, and then the one population in Indiana. Um, because of the way the weather worked out when we were in Kentucky, we only got a lot of visitors in 2023, which haven't been fully identified to species or had their pollen counted yet. So most of what we're gonna see in this presentation is from Tennessee and Indiana. Uh, but looking at what we caught last year, it's pretty uniform across the range. Um, so we caught insects. There's a lazy oglossum on Fisaria in the picture there. And then we washed them to check for loose pollen and counted the ratio of Fisaria to non-Fisaria pollen on their exoskeletons, also making pollen slides of other co-flowering species to make sure we weren't misidentifying any pollen. 
Luckily, Fisaria has a really unique pollen shape, kind of looks like a beach ball with five sulci. Um, so we were able to identify the Fisaria pollen on the floral visitors and classify any that had Fisaria pollen as potential pollinators. So from 21, 2021 and 2022, out of 408 visitors, and there's an additional about 160 from 2023 that haven't been uh, looked at yet, 72% um, of all of our floral visitors we caught were hymenopterans. Most of those are going to be solitary generalist bees. And then our second most abundant was dipter at about 14% and then coleoptera at about 9%. And most of those coleopterans were tiny flower beetles that are gonna be feeding on pollen and nectar within the flowers. And then if we look at the percentage of um, visitors that were carrying Fisaria pollen, 67% of all of our visitors had Fisaria pollen on them. And of those 69% were hymenopterans um, with only a few of those being ants and wasps. So mainly solitary ground nesting bees. And then again, about 8% beetles and 18% true flies. Looking at just the bees by genus and species, um, I have the likely effect of pollinators um, or what I've classified as effective pollinators highlight on, highlighted on this slide. So we have Andrina, which are small mining bees, Serotina or small carpenter bees, the Oglochlorini are all the green metallic sweat bees, and then Lazioglossum are just like your normal generic sweat bees. And the ones that are not highlighted, we did catch um, at least one of each of these groups, but they were either not caught in high enough numbers or they didn't have a high enough or significant enough pollen load to be classified as um, effective pollinators. And apis, I didn't classify as effective, even though it probably is because it's not native. I wanted to highlight only the native effect of pollinators. So long, uh, monitoring using traditional methods are very expensive and time consuming. So we wanted to see if we could monitor these pollinator communities using environmental DNA uh, meta barcoding by extracting, amplifying, and sequencing animal DNA from the flowers. Um, and then the picture on the right here is one of those tiny flower beetles that we were catching in the field. So looking at CO1 for Fisaria first, um, the majority of our sequences were identified as thrips, true bugs, which were primarily aphids and those tiny flower beetles. Um, and then while bees were the most commonly caught in the field, they only made up about 1% of the identified unique sequences. But I should note that this pie chart is the abundance of identified unique sequences. It's not gonna correlate to how many were actually in the field. Looking at 16S, we also have thrips, aphids, and those small beetles as the top um, most abundant sequences with bees, moths, true flies, and wasps being a little bit lower. Um, but we were detecting more moths and uh, wasps than we were expecting based off of what we caught in the field. So it's a little bit interesting that we're catching or we're detecting things that we weren't observing as much. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then last year while I was up in Kentucky, I was invited to come out and uh, collect a few flowers from Trifolium stoloniferum just to see if we could detect anything. We threw it on the same meta barcoding run as the Fisaria. And we saw a pretty similar thing that we saw with Fisaria, uh, mostly thrips, mites, and segmented worms with wasps, bees, and true bugs kind of coming up behind. And then for 16S on Trifolium, we only had 18 unique sequences make it through filtering and get identified. So I'm not really sure what was going on with that. The other three that we just looked at had at least a thousand sequences identified. Um, so something was going on with that, not really sure what it was. But then if we look at the bees that we detected using eDNA, um, we missed a lot of bees that we know are gonna be effective pollinators of Fisaria, but of the bees we did detect using eDNA, 
the majority of them are either species we know are pollinating or are very closely related to known pollinators. We didn't detect any serpid flies, which may have to do with them hovering off of the flowers while they're feeding and not visiting for as long as the bees. And then to end just some ma uh, major takeaways, um, pollinator eDNA metabarcoding shouldn't be a replacement for traditional monitoring methods, but it is an excellent supplement and it can be used to detect more cryptic plant animal interactions like those with moths that may be visiting at night or parasitoid wasps that are difficult to observe and capture. And then I wanna acknowledge our agency partners and Tennessee Tech, and as well our funding partners with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Botanical Society of America.